So today uh, we've elected to, well, I've elected to do a conversation between Oakville and Alexander Valley. And the reason I, I chose this topic is because of a long standing history that I have with uh, Napa Valley and Alexander Valley. Obviously, most of my experience is around Alexander Valley until 1999 when we. Well, 1998 actually, when Shandon uh, was selling Napa Cabernet to Simi. And so I got started at, in getting to know Napa pretty well back then, because if you recall back in those days, no one could sell Pinot Noir. And so today, if you drive into Shandon Winery, the first few rows are Chardonnay, and then you've got a few rows of Pinot Noir, and then you've got all the rest of that property is actually planted a Cabernet. And so that cabinet was going to see me. And because of that, I was, my headquarters were over there. And when we got bought by Franciscan, well, bought by Constellation, they moved my office to Franciscan. So I had a, um, I got to know Alexander Napa Valley very well. Primarily around Rutherford, Oakville and Yonville. And I find that, that the differences between those appellations, in, a, in rough terms, we all talk about Rutherford dust. Yes, I agree. Wineries like Camus, and etc they, they those wines have a lot of finesse and a lot of weight and i do like the graininess on the back of the mouth i and i think that rutherford is a, is a tremendous appellation and a really and a really worthy of its number one status probably in napa valley however for me i chose oakville to work in because i find that the the tannins in oakville are more similar to what i worked with in alexander valley i find the tannins in oakville silkier rounder and then you get this volume of flavors without having any dryness. Yonville in the meantime is a little bit cooler. And the main reason is, is because unlike Alexander Valley, where I've explained that in the mornings we'll wake up and we have fog because we have fog coming from the ocean that usually gets brought in by the breezes in the afternoons. So for instance, last night, as usual, it was a very windy evening and we had the fog coming in from the coast. It comes through the Petaluma and the Gap in the north and Skag Spring, South and Skag Spring in the North. For Napa Valley, however, though, you have to wait for the sun to come up in the morning. And so when the sun shines on Mount St. Helena, that's what drags the cold air up from San Francisco Bay. So that's why Yonville is cooler than Oakville and Rutherford, et cetera. So you have to wait a fairly long uh, part of the morning before that cold air makes its way all the way up Napa Valley. Hence, Napa Valley is warmer than the Alexander Valley. So I thought I'd do a face-off with what we do. Unfortunately, you probably don't have the wines in front of you. Uh, and I've already opened it. I had a big day of tasting yesterday. So I've already, uh, in celebration, I opened a bottle of Catherine this morning just to give it a bit of a test run. So here we go. So um, I put this photo up. I, I, I used this uh, on a Facebook post recently. And so I thought I'd show it again. So experience obviously is me but impulsiveness is also an attribute for great winemaking. And I, and I see this in my son, of course, uh, that's my son on the right. We're missing one child, we're missing Chelsea, she's not in the photo, and we're missing one dog. But impulsiveness and creativeness is also important. And I, and I sometimes worry with my own winemaking that because I've got more and more experience as I get older, that I am moving away from my impulsive, creative upbringing. And that's why it's really important for me to come into the market to hear from you guys directly. And it's really important to taste with the youth of today. And uh, so I really enjoy that part of my life. Looking at the valleys itself, as we go through this uh, little talk, I'm going to always talk about Oakville first and Alexander Valley second, because I like to uh, uh, get people to think the other way. I can't use my mouse, unfortunately, when I'm on a webinar, unlike when I can do it on a regular Zoom meeting, so you'll have to bear with me. So you can see uh, Yonville, Oakville, and Rutherford, the primo, primo areas, and uh, to the east, if you look at the Oakville, and then you head uh, towards the east, you're talking about the mountain ranges that are, that are fairly steep, heading in that direction. Um, although that's where Pritchard Hill, etc., is. And then on the Oakville, where you see the sign Oakville heading to the west, of course, that's Tokelo in the area. So most of Oakville is relatively flat, except for this little knoll, this little bump in the, in the main part of Oakville. And that's where 
will focus our attention today because it's a really unique and really, I think, geographically a really important site, and that's what gravitated me to working there. In the Alexander Valley, I often talk about this why, and you'll see the Russian River. If you look on towards the south part of the map, you'll see that the Russian River takes a little dog leg there. Um, that is because we have a mountain here called Fitch Mountain. For those who have been to Healdsburg, Fitch Mountain is a dominant factor. And uh, that is one of the reasons why the river was blocked um, as part of the earthquake, which we could talk about. And you'll see that the Russian River now flows out towards to, to the coast, uh, like uh, where we were, uh, where Jenner is. And so uh, we need about another 30 million years to make Russian River Valley a true valley, but it's a good marketing spiel. The, uh, the valley itself looks like a long Y for me. So if you, the middle of that Y obviously is Geyserville. And then we have the two pieces as we head towards the east. You go into Knights Valley, through the Myakamas, and into, into Napa Valley, Calistoga. And if you head towards the west, you head into Healdsburg, and then obviously down on 101 to the south. But Healdsburg is a beautiful little town. Obviously, we have the unions of Dry Creek, Alexander Valley, Chalk Hill, and Russian River all meet in beautiful downtown Healdsburg. We're very lucky to live here. In terms of face-offs, the most important face-offs that have occurred recently is uh, obviously we've got Biden and Trump coming up. Speaking of V-Day or V-E Day, this is the match between the All Blacks, who are the New Zealand rugby team and the English team. And New Zealand is set in that little V or that triangle, as you can see, sorry, the English are in the V. The black, All Blacks from New Zealand, the rugby team, they're in the uh, triangle there because this is the haka, which is one of the native dances that we have in New Zealand. And to defy it, this is the first time ever that a team has defied and given respect to the New Zealand haka. And so the English decided to form themselves into a V for victory because they thought they were going to beat the All Blacks on that day. Ha, ha, ha. The other funny thing I thought was this, um, I don't know if you guys saw this taste off between Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks and, and McDonald's. Uh, they had uh, they did a blind coffee tasting in a number of supermarkets when they were still open and guess who won? McDonald's. McDonald's slaughtered. <laughs> McDonald's coffee beat Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts and I think there was another one, I think uh, one of the other, the, like I can't remember if it was Seattle coffee or whatever. Uh, and then below that, of course, we have the uh, defining moment of the the Super Bowl that I wanted and everybody wanted, Kansas City against the Niners. Unfortunately, we came out on the losing end, but I thought it was uh, an incredible game. And then in future, we have the Big America's Cup race. This is the uh, match where New Zealand Emirates, Team Emirates, uh, beat Oracle uh, in New Zealand. And uh, so the America's Cup is still being maintained in New Zealand. I don't know if you've seen the new, obviously I'm a sailor, and or an ex sailor, and the new yachts are. I think the entry fee is 50 million, and then you have to pay for your boats. Each team has two boats, and they're 45 footers, uh, 42 footers, mono hulls, and they're going to be on two, two foils. So these things are going to sail twice as fast as the wind. So it's going to be an incredible race, and it's going to be um, the warm up series will be later in 2020, but the real race will be in the summer of 2021. So looking um, at the at the what the key elements, I'm gonna talk a little bit about clones and mass selections again, just to be sure that you guys understand that. Some of the other things that I'm really working on is, is trying to get away from use of herbicides. Um, I've talked about that and and I showed last week the use of a mechanical plow, if you, if you remember that, to remove weeds. And that is a really important development. And I think a lot of, uh, that this is brand new technology and it's going to become more important and uh, just like machine harvesters have become better than hand harvesting I think these new machines for weeding are going to end up being better than using Roundup etc anyway cane pruning which I talked exclusively about in the in uh, the second one of these talks that I did and then the physical training of the vineyards and I think we've done a really good job internationally obviously starting in New Zealand I think that what we do now in Australia and Chile and we're just starting now in Argentina and California is really making sure that these vineyards are trained correctly and not allowed to fall over and we discussed that um, a couple of weeks ago in number four. The I put up this chart a couple of times it's 
and uh, number two, when number three, when we're talking about Chardonnays, that we really had a development of the way we planted vineyards. I'm not going to go through it like I did last time, but really, the there was a, the original five vineyards in Napa Valley and the original five five wineries in Napa Valley and the original five wineries in the in, in Sonoma County as well. So over here, part of the original five was the the the, um, the Petrocellis, the Segacios, the Simis, um, um, the Valley of the Moon was another one, um, etc. So uh, it was sort of an equivalent, you know, Napa Valley and and Sonoma, Sonoma County were being developed at the same time. But really, the big change happened um, after Prohibition. In fact, um, to celebrate it, I always, every time I drive past Simi, I look at those, um, the redwoods, because Isabel Simi planted those redwoods in 1933 on December 5th, when Prohibition ended. And uh, the, those trees are pretty big trees today. So that was what she did in celebration for that. But the vineyards that we work on, uh, mass selections and I talked and I'd love to talk about it again as perhaps uh, six or seven months from now when we talk about how we're developing the staircase vineyard and the selections that we've chosen a uh, cabernet selections that we've chosen and going through the attributes of each one of those and hopefully that um, that will, will prove true and really trying to stay away from clones because those clones were developed for high tonnage and fast accumulation of sugar not allowing the extended hand time, which I deem is really important for flavor and tannin development. So that's uh, what I mentioned here is the clones are really, oh, my mouse is working, crazy. Uh, <laughs> said it didn't work. The larger yields obviously we get with the clones and the, and the faster gathering of sugar. And that's why it's so funny that people, and, and you guys hear it talked about more often with Chardonnay, you know, Dijon clones, the UC Davis clones, et cetera, et cetera. But we, um, it's also important for Cabernet, but remember they are selected for tonnage and vigor and, and gather and accumulating sugar. Whereas in mass selections, we have the looser cluster, which you'll see a little bit as we go through some of the videos and it's maturity a little bit slower. So looking at the wines facing off against each other, we got Catherine, uh, which is obviously the vineyard that I've been, oh, it's the, oh yeah. The um, Catherine, which, uh, is our Alexander Valley blend, which is extremely popular. It's our number one selling wine. This is the, the 2018 is the current release and that wine retails at around about $25. And Hillary, which is from Oakville. And uh, this is a wine I make with my youngest daughter, who's actually in the room next door on school, as they do right now. And this, um, this wine retails at about $50, $55, which is probably, I don't know what's going on with pricing out there right now, who knows, but until uh, this um, pandemic, it was definitely the best value um, Cabernet from Oakville on the market. The second, um, and we've done a lot of looking at, around this, the second most popular or the second best value was the Mondavi Oakville at $75. So Hillary at $55 is certainly a bargain when you compare it with the rest of the Appalachian. Moving up a price point, we have Game Ranch. So this is the vineyard that I was talking about and we'll look at a map a little more closely with that. And then of course, Yeoman. My idea originally was, I wanted to make these two wines exactly the same because they're such fantastic vineyards. But when I do blind tastings with, with punters, with um, retailers, consumers, etc., nine times out of, well, eight times out of 10, they prefer the Yeoman, but they end up buying the, the Game Ranch. And so, 10 years ago when we started this in 19, the first vintage was 1999, the wines were at the same price. We have not raised the price on Yeoman since the day we started, but we have taken up the Game Ranch a dollar a bottle every year because I, what I really want to do is sell them at the same speed. So today um, Yeoman still, still sells at around about $75 retail and the Game Ranch sells at around um, 85 and you'll notice the new label too. I don't know if you guys have seen the new label. And this is also the new label on the plus. Again, it still has the red motif, red on top. And this is the black. This is the black. This is um, the, actually I've got the around the other way this time. This is the Alexander Valley and this is the, um, the Oakville. So very limited production, which we'll talk about. We make three to four barrels in any particular year. So just checking in on Oakville where we are. 
the one on the right here is is where Hillary is, and so this is Highway 29. Uh, this is Oakville Cross right here, which we'll talk about in a second. This is Oakville Cross right here. This is Napa Wine Company, which used to be Inglenook. This is Opus. This is Mondavi. This is Nickel Nickel, and this is Hittery. So this is the Nickel and Nickel Vineyard. Comes up here. This is the Opus Vineyard, and you'll know that you're in the right spot because this piece of property here is not planted. This guy grows hay because he doesn't like grapes. Over here, and then you'll um, head this direction, and you'll end up coming past here. This is uh, Groth Winery, which you guys all know. This is Plump Jack. This is Rudd, and Rudd crosses the street. Obviously, it's on both sides of the road. This is, uh, next to us is Gargiulio, which basically is mainly direct. I don't think there's a lot out there. This is Tench. Tench is a pretty famous vineyard. It's, uh, they don't have their own wine, or they make very little of their own wine, but most of the grapes are sold. And then right here, this is Screaming Eagle. So Screaming Eagle, Tench, Silver Oak, Groth, Plump Jack, Rudd, and that winery over there is Minor. So again, we're in a really good communa. And you can see that this is a hillside and it's very steep and you can't plant this. And I, you wouldn't want to plant this anyway because it's, that, that vineyard is looking southeast or south. Uh, the east side is all right, but this is, this is going to be too warm and also it's too steep anyway. So our vineyard faces northeast, so it's a relatively cool site when compared to the valley floor vineyards of Silver Oak. This is more of a, you can't tell here, but there's a little bit of a slope in here. Um, from Gargiulio through into Screaming Eagle. But the rest of this area is all relatively flat, as you know. You don't get into hillsides until you get up over here or, <coughs> or over into, um, into um, Tokelum. Looking at the vineyard itself, the ultimatum uh, piece is the top. We haven't talked about that wine. I'm not going to talk about that today but we because we haven't released it. This is the regular game ranch and then the plus vines are the more vigorous vines on the outside of the road. Where we talk about in the Alexander Valley, as I said, this is Fitch Mountain down here. I'm sitting right here with this blue dot is the red dot is where I live. And this is a Y down uh, around Fitch Mountain. And as I said, you head over to the Alexander Valley and we're gonna be talking about the Yeoman and the Catherine vineyards today. So looking at the valley where Catherine is, it's made up of five growers. It used to just be two growers, but today there's now five owners of this beautiful property. The fires in, eight, um, the fires in uh, 18 came, uh, 17, sorry, man. <laughs> uh, the fires came down this way uh, and this, we had already harvested here, so we were very lucky, but this barn here, which you can see in this photo, this barn here no longer exists, it was burnt. This is the Yeoman Vineyard and Catherine sits right below it. This piece up here we use for another project. So the big deal is, of course, the hang time, which I already mentioned. We basically de-stem. We don't do any additions of any kind in the hopper. We leave everything open to the environment. And I sort of learned this technique working with Zelma Long. And, and obviously, my main focus at Simi in the early days was Chardonnay. Really, Cabernet didn't really kick in until like 94, 95, when it became a dominant part of what we did. And I sort of used that sort of crushing technique that we did on Chardonnay with red. So trying to make, and the reason why we do that is because I want to make the wines really stable. And if you expose juice to oxygen, the juice becomes more stable. It becomes not only color stable, but the tannins also become stable. So we start this process very, very early on in its, in its life. And you've heard me talk about before how our wines move from purple to red, but they don't move brown to orange. And this is part of the reason why the, the wines are really stable. I put three weeks here for color stability, but obviously with the plus wines that we talk about, we talk about closer to five to six weeks. And we'll talk briefly about elegant, powerful, and dense winemaking, but I don't want to bore you because we did cover that in site-specific Cabernet, which we discussed. After we press off, though, I do chill the tanks because I want to make sure I've got all the solids uh, racked off because these solids are really important because this is where Britannomyces likes to hang out. There's a lot more nutrients sitting in the in the juice there, and uh, so the um, uh, this is a good way to avoid the bread. I'm going to jump off the screen here, and I'm just going to draw a couple of 
this is the only time I'm going to do some drawings. And um, I'll let you, hopefully you guys will bear with me because you know that's what I do. Any questions? I see a couple of chats there, Michael. Is there any questions? No, no, we're good so far. You're on a roll. All right, so um, what I'm going to look at is uh, the, f the first drawing. I, I don't always do this, but the, this is the drawing I should do, which is just, just a quick reminder of, of how we ripen. If this is, this is flowering, which we think is going to happen in, in our area in the next 10 days, probably. And uh, this, is, this is harvest. I just want to spend a bit more time on a little bit more detail, which I don't normally do on this. So this is acidity, which you all know. This is veraison, where the berries change colour. The, the, the increase in bricks, which I've discussed before. Flavour starts off low and, and increases as we get closer to harvest. And tannins move from green to dusty to dry to ripe. And this in Bordeaux is 100 days. Okay, you guys have seen me do this before. But the key thing is this thing about alcohol and balance. Oh, and remember, if you have a high, high crop, you're going to get the tannins take a longer time to ripen. If you have a low crop, tannins ripen very quickly and flavor ripens slower uh, relative to the tannin. But if you want to, if you want to make a wine at 13 alcohol, which is, which is where we're heading for Cabernet, I know it sounds crazy, but I really think that we've got to get back down. I mean, those wines from the 30s that were made at Simi and BV and then when you look at those alcohols, they're all around about 12 and a half. So what was the difference? Well, one of the major differences was the mass selections and field selections that they were using. These were not clones. These were not fast accumulators of sugar. So they were able to hand this, they were allowed to put this hang time out a little bit longer. But today, using a clone, if you want to make a wine at 13 alcohol, you wait for the sugar to get there. And you can see on your tongue, because the alcohol sits here, the fruit and the tannin are not ripe. And so the wine will finish short and the wine will taste alcoholic because there's no fruit there to support it. If you wait too long, we call some of these winemakers the Raisin Brothers. And if they're online, they know who they are. If you wait for that sugar to get to uh, 15, 16 alcohol because you think that the tannins are taking too long to ripen, you can imagine when you get there, the alcohol becomes so dominant, your wine finishes short again. So the wine is so alcoholic, it makes the fruit finish short. So you have to figure out where you're going to make the picking decision and what vineyard attributes you're going to um, employ to try and get the maturity to hang out. Because as I've said, instead of 100 days <coughs> in the Alexander Valley, we can hit 145 days. In the Napa Valley, we can hit 135 days, which is also the same as Marlborough in New Zealand. Even though it's a different latitude, different variety, uh, we still can extend the hang time. The other thing that, the, and the way that we measure this is when we go into the vineyard, uh, if you have, uh, we put it in, you, if you go on my YouTube channel, you'll see me do this multiple times, put the berry in my mouth, spit the pulp out, and under the skin are these vacuoles. And in the vacuoles, this is where protein and tannin and polyphenolic material hang out. And that's really what we want to do. All right, now jumping back into the EPD winemaking, you'll have seen me discuss this before is we don't use clones. We use mass selections. And that's how we can get this extra long hang time. So when you take this aerial view and we're gonna, you've seen that drone shot. I, I can't remember if I have it in this video or not, but we have that drone shot where uh, the, with Catherine, we have different vigor in the, in the canopy. So, you know, this is the highly vigorous piece, which we call the dense vineyard where the canopy is really out of balance. It's a very strong canopy, but a low crop. And this is where we started making plus. It's the same philosophy. So on this chart, we are, we are talking about a shorter hang time because this canopy is so strong. Here is what we call the powerful vines, and this is the elegant vines. These vines tend to be a little bit out of balance as well. They tend to have a smaller crop, I mean a larger crop for the size of the canopy. And so we've got to be very careful about that. And then you'll recall that when I put the wines together, there's three sorts of cabernets that we look for in a blend or three sorts of attributes, styles that we look for in a, 
and a red wine. These are the elegant wines, which are the soft berry fruit wines, the powerful wines and the dense wines, which provide the structure and the finish. And these, this is my definition of complexity. I'm not gonna go into the winemaking process. We've discussed that previously in other, in other talks. What I do wanna talk though is, is about style. And I don't, I've never, I don't do this chart very often, but today I thought it was appropriate because I really want to discuss the differences that I see between Oakville and Alexander Valley. So you see me with my Chardonnay chart where I talk about warm fruit and cool fruit. In this situation, it's relatively safe. So, but we're talking about red grapes. So we are talking about red fruit and black fruit. So high end warm fruit, strawberry, um raspberry and then we get to sort of uh red cherry and we get for for some of us i don't know if you guys know this but i eat a lot of black peaches and we have a black peach tree at my house so there's black peach character and then we talk about sort of blueberry being the mid and if i get rid of this and uh the the worst the worst uh, black fruit is black currants. I worked on a black currant machine harvester once. Not fun. That stuff stinks. It's so green and spicy. And if I see it in Cabernet, I automatically think, I wonder if it's Carmen Air is that strong. But yeah, you can't have Cabernets with that character. So black currant, uh, you get to black berries um, and sort of the black cherry character. Now on this side, when we talk about I, I sort of t when I talk about red grapes, I talk about it a little bit differently. With white grapes, we talk about the the structure and the texture, and based on you know malolactic and and sweetness and acidity and CO two and all this stuff. A lot of that stuff is relevant here, but not all of it. So again, if we put structure on the on the left here, and, and we talk about a structural wine doing this, you know. Comes in the, it comes in the mouth broad and then has this lean character. You know, the most extreme would be a Vina Verde from Portugal or something like that. That's, that's an extreme structural situation. And on this side, we talk about texture being coming in the mouth broad and finishing broad. But what I like to talk about here is, is uh, the main, just the, the really main attributes of this is this is acidity and fruit. And God damn it, this is a fruit product. This is not Coca-Cola, dude. I think too many Cabernets taste like Coca-Cola. People love fractos. Anyway, we can talk about that later. Um, and then over here on this side, we talk about sugar and alcohol. And as I've said before, you know, the yeast, yeast will ferment if this is uh, bricks, okay, and this is thyme. Glucose, so we talk about glucose and fructose or fructose or whatever you guys call it. So what happens is glucose does this, ends up being dry, but fructose goes like this. It never finishes fermentation. And if you have high alcohol, because what happens here is alcohol increases and once that alcohol hits, about 15 percent or 14 and a half now because the yeast are actually becoming less efficient these days once you hit about 14 and a half 15 percent the yeast start dying and when they die the fructose is left and this fructose is really sweet much sweeter than what you get with glucose and that's why when you drink these high alcohol wines they're sweet not only do you get the alcohol sweetness but you also get the sugar sweetness and that's also where you get bread, but we could talk all about that. Because Britannomyces, which is a yeast, can actually ferment fructose. And that's why high alcohol wines tend to have more bread. I'm not knocking all my brothers in Napa, but we over here, and I'll explain because Alexander Valley is cooler than the Napa Valley. So if I was to draw in here a, style, a generic style of Alexander Valley, and of course I'm primarily talking about Catherine because that's the one you're most exposed to, but it's even more extreme in Yeoman, you end up with, we're not fully structured, but we're definitely more on the structural side. We get up to this red cherry end of the spectrum, 
And so this for me is Alexander Valley. I, uh, in some cases we get down to the blackberry, but really um, it's not. Um, we do include the black cherry here. Now, if I was to draw in here, Hillary or Game Ranch, you're gonna get a lot more texture because remember it's a warmer environment. So the tannins, the tannins are completely different because this is, this is also tannin. Remember tannin is, is an acid. And so that's what's helping to push it. But with, when you're over in a warmer climate like Napa Valley, you're pushing more of the textural elements because the amount of tannin drops quicker relative to the acid. So what you end up with stylistically is a wine like that. So that's the main difference between what I think Alexander Valley and Napa Valley is. So this is why I, you've heard me talk about before that when I'm eating food, I drink Alexander Valley because it has more acidity. So it actually makes you hungry or thirsty and actually pairs much easier with food than something with high alcohol and a lot of sugar. And that's why with my cheese courses, I tend to drink Napa Valley. It's pretty funny. When I, when I, in the, when, in the late eighties, early nineties, when I was over here, especially in the nineties, when a lot of my Australian, I do have friends from Australia. A lot of my Australian friends would come over and they go, dude, these Napa Valleys are too sweet. And they, cause, after dinner in Australia, we drink muskets and tokays. There's an amazing appellation that you guys know, not very, not very many of you know much about it, which is called Rother Glen. Rother Glen is, in, is on the border between Victoria and New South Wales, and there's a really, really arid area there. And these vineyards are over 100 years old, and they're, mu they're orange musket, black musket, and, and tokay. Everyone thinks they come from Hungary. No, they're much better in Australia, mate. Anyway, so when we have dinner or we eat a cheese course, we eat those sort of things. But over here, we drink Napa. It's the same thing, but it's sweeter and rounder and richer. I'm not knocking it. It's just that because it's a warm environment, you get the stylistically different. So generically, you would say Napa Valley, and particularly for us, because we work in Oakville, you're gonna, you, you get the sweetness, you get the black fruit, but because we, we were in Oakville, it's a little bit cooler. I could move this chart a little bit more in the Alexander Valley direction. And that's why I wanted to make Yeoman and Game Ranch. I wanted to, take the two best vineyards that I possibly could find and make Game Ranch and Yeoman and make them the same with a little bit of a brighter acidity um, to try and, and, and try and compare them. So if you haven't done a comparison, especially do it with the 16s. I mean, they're, to put the Game Ranch and the Yeoman next to each other, rock solid, man. Really interesting. Hey, Nick. Um, Fred was saying, uh, you, you said that tannin is an acid and he thought it was a phenolic compound. You want to comment on that? <laughs> Well, tannic acid is uh, tannic. <laughs> tannic acid, tannin acid. Well, the there is a little bit of a confusion between um, you need tannin isn't tannin is an acid. I mean, if you think about it with leather, that's the most most extreme case. But the uh, that compound. But I'm not sure if you're on. Uh, earlier when we um, just the real <clears throat> you know it's it, these these are um important compounds to to measure and the key one you've probably seen me some of you have seen me draw this before but the key the key uh element of course is an anthocyanin now this element is not very acidic at all this is this is the malvidin 3 glucoside the flavanol thing, right? This is an anthocyanin. Okay, this is purple. And as that compound gets bigger, it becomes more acidic. So what happens is this is oxygen, this OH, this hydroxyl ion cleaves off, forms an H2 molecule, and you get an oxygen molecule here, and then you join another one of these elements onto here, and that's a tannin. And that's when it becomes more acidic. And so if you take those it's, it's a really good question because if you take the, um, you know, you've heard me talk before about wines moving from purple to red to brown to orange, and you see this crusty stuff here, that's polymeric pigment. Now, if you get your finger and you taste it, you'll get the, you'll, you'll feel, you'll feel the flavor, but you'll also feel the acid. So that is, it's a crystalline, 
um, process that's occurring. And so it, it's, it's an acid compound that's actually falling out. Normally, you know, if you put something in the fridge, you'll get the tartrates. People talk about tartrates that fall out, but there's a lot of other acids in wine. We only talk about tartaric acid, malic acid, and lactic acid. But there are, there's tannic acid, succinic acid, zeto acid. And there's a lot of other acids in, uh, in wine that we also have to deal with. So yes, it's, not, it's there. It's not a dominant acid, but um, that's, that's part of the process. Hope that answers your question. Uh, let's jump back in. Yes, I did draw. <laughs> but there is the beautiful Nickel Nickel Winery and their vineyard and that's Hillary down there at that end and there's Opus, beautiful Opus out here in the Oakville getting ready to pick Hillary tomorrow. Cabernet Sauvignon, Oakville, Napa Valley. And you can see that that uh, little field there that the guy doesn't like uh, doesn't like growing grapes, pretty funny. This is the drone shot that I've shown you before of the difference. This is uh, this is the vigorous part of the vineyard. Michael, if you have a question, I'm just going to put the microphone back in. If there's a question, just put your hand up. I'll see that. So this is um, this is the vigorous part of the vineyard. As I said, this is where we make the dense wine. This was the hardest thing for me to understand because the tannins moved really quickly. You know, dry, dry, dry raisin. So I had to start picking earlier, and because I realised the canopies were too big. This is the powerful part of the vineyard where the crop and the vines are in the right balance. And here, this is the elegant part of the vineyard where the, um, the canopy is too small for the size of the crop. So here we do actually remove crop. And this is the um, suburban that I've mentioned earlier that my little daughter Hillary smashed. And this is the last uh, view that I ever had of it or the last day that I drove it. So yeah, she's looking for some uh, insurance money if anybody wants to pony up. <laughs> It's hard to believe I've been working on this vineyard since 1990 and what did a, a silly Kiwi coming to California know about making Cabernet? I mean all we made was Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot and Chard. Anyway, 1990 I was a winemaker at Simi and I started making wine from this vineyard at that time. So history is really important to me. I've been making wine not only for that length of time but these vines have been here that whole time growing this beautiful gravelly loam soil which uh, has great water holding capacity but also great throughput. The vine itself, since these were planted back then, is not a clone itself. These are mass selections and this was called, there is two parts, there's the Jackson and the Jenkins and I'm sitting right now in the Jackson selection and you can tell that we have, like you'll see with Chardonnay, we have big berries and small berries in the same cluster. They're relatively small berries and very open as well, so we get good light penetration throughout the cluster. We're very close to harvest. Actually the leaves still have a little bit of water in them, which is good, but they are lightening up, and so we'll be picking this in the next two or three days. Catherine Goldschmidt, Alexander Valley Cabernet, just a phenomenal, phenomenal vineyard with a lot of history, both from me and history from the vine as well. Beautiful. I don't think I'm going to keep rustling uh, the leaves. I, I, because on the, when, you, when you film it, it sounds like the leaves are crispy. They're not crispy. Um, but I, I learned that in school when I was doing um, biodynamic uh, vegetable growing, that, uh, that the touching of the leaf or the, or the plant is really, really important. And I do that a lot. And, and when, you, when you do that in the vineyard, you hear the that's a dry sound, the sh 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 sound has, has got more moisture. And then feeling the leaf as well. And there's a lot to be learned from doing it yourself rather than using what we call pressure bombs where we could do a whole class on this. So you, you, we, we, we break a leaf off from the same vine at the same time every day. We break a leaf, we put it in a pressure chamber, we apply CO2, and as soon as we see a drip of sap coming out the end of the, of the uh, the stem there, we know what the pressure is and we measure it in bars and then we determine how much water we're gonna put on. I tell you what, I get just as much information by walking into the same vineyard as I have done for 30 years. I don't know, just me. G'day, Nick Goldschmidt here. I'm sitting here with three glasses of wine and everything we do is single vineyard and the way we get complexity out of a single vineyard is by choosing blocks and styles or working the wines 
to the way the vines best exemplify themselves. So when I was young, I walked into a room once at a pretty well-known winery with 200 wines on the table. I'm wondering how am I going to blend 200 wines? I came from New Zealand, I didn't know anything about Cabernet. And so working with a consultant, we figured out the best way to do this is to put them into families. Elegant wines, which are the soft berry fruit wines right up on front of the tongue. The powerful wines, which provide the fleshness and the richness. And the dense wines, which give us structure and power. So when we go ahead and line all those wines up, I sorted all the elegant wines together and I, made a, I chose the best elegant wines and made a blend. I got the best powerful wines and made a blend, the best dense wines and made a blend. And we had three wines, all from the same vineyard, all from maybe in the same block or not the same block, but all from the same vineyard. And then we made a blend of these three wines and it was the most complex wine that we could possibly make. I just want to leave it there because I, I, I don't want to go into the winemaking piece, but I just, I, I wanted to emphasize the fact that this is the way you make complex wines from single vineyards uh, or single blocks. And um, this is the uh, taste stop between Hillary and Catherine. So what do I know? So this is the 2016 was rated a 93 and the Catherine was rated one point behind. It's funny, we did, we did very early on in my life, we looked at, uh, we tracked um, when I had more resources, we tracked Wine Spectator versus Parker, and even Jim Lalby from the Wine Spectator came out one day and said, Napa Valley will always be five points more than the Alexander Valley. I mean, wow, that, that was earth shattering for me because I always thought, you know, we like fruity wines and this is why cool climate is more interesting. I'm not knocking Jim, I mean, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but, uh, so even today, if I do a side-by-side -side tasting, it doesn't matter who, I'm talking about the major, the major uh, publications, of course, they always seem to put uh, anything from Napa Valley above. Um... Good afternoon, everybody. Here I am standing at Game Ranch, looking north in Oakville, across the street. You can see Groth Winery over there. That's Plump Jack straight in front of me. That's Minor Family that you can see on the hill, of course. And below that is Rudd. And next to us, facing into that little valley there and facing west, a little warmer, but not too bad, is Gargiulio Vineyards. And then, of course, if I swing around, I would be looking towards Screaming Eagle. So just a beautiful day out here in Game Ranch, checking it out. Oh, and I almost forgot my brothers next door, of course which is Silver Oak. Yeoman, Alexander Valley Cabernet. Look at the age of that vine. Fantastic, spectacular. Look at that soil. Little gravelly, little loamy. And look at those clusters. Open, loose. And that's the definition, I hope, or that's what I look at when I consider good Cabernet. You know, these loose clusters, uh, means that these berries uh, get sunlight all around them and they're loose because this is an old mass selection. We call this the Jenkins selection, so it's not a clone. And it's on rootstock that was planted before Phylloxera, but luckily they didn't use AXR1. So these vines are well over 30 years old now and we've been making yeoman from this vineyard since the first time in 1998 was the first ever vintage. The other thing that's really cool is the size of the berries. Uh, they're nice and small. We can see that we've got good lignification here now, so we're almost close to harvest. The other thing I like about it is cane pruned. So this is last year's wood, and so these shoots are well spaced. We don't get the spur positions like um, like many vineyards do. They do spur pruning where you get two shoots and then you get a lot more congestion. Whereas this this pruning technique is far more relevant for high quality, and, and as far as I'm concerned. The other cool thing, it's a terrace vineyard so it's not straight lines across it's planted on the contour and these rows face um, east to northeast so it's a relatively cool location as well anyway this is the beautiful yeoman vineyard i hope you get to try the wine yeoman goldschmidt out here in the alexander valley and looking at the uh, accolades again it's pretty funny there was a point difference so the yeoman uh is uh is you know one point behind the game ranch this is the 15 we don't have the scores on the 16s but uh maybe maybe it's a price point thing this was something that we looked at with one of the wineries in chile uh 
I'm not going to tell you who it was, but we sent the same wine into the same wine writer uh, at three different price points with three different labels. And guess what? The scores came back matching the price point. So I don't know, maybe price point has something to do with it as well. But give Alexander Valley a chance, man. It's pretty cool. Good morning from the heart of Oakville. I'm getting asked a, a lot about where our various wines come from and I just want to show, looking at this block, uh, sorry about the traffic noise that's going by me. It's the Oakville Crossroad and I'm sorry that I'm looking right into the sun. I always seem to be here in the morning. But the top of the block up there is where we make Ultimatum. A, the lower block here is a combination of Game Ranch and Game Ranch Plus. Now, the outer three rows here and the outer three rows on the other end of the block are where we make the plus. Plus we take the three outside rows of the ultimatum block as well. The game ranch that comes from here is also sometimes blended with this block here. This is a very, very old Vigneto Cabernet non-clonal old mass selection, really, really unique. You can see the age of the vine here. So these vines were planted in the 70s, whereas the vineyard on the hill was planted in 1990. Anyway, that's the location of the three wines, and I hope that makes it clear. All the Just thought I'd do a quick video of Goldschmidt Game Ranch Plus. Look at the size of this canopy, and that's because we're on the outside row. There is no competition, and so we make the Game Ranch Plus from these three outside rows. They have much bigger canopy, a smaller crop, and if I come in here, you'll see that the clusters are also very open. And that's because with this much vigor, they blow the flowers off during flowering, and so we don't get a complete set, so the clusters are more open, more even, more interesting. But to make Game Ranch Plus, this is only one of five attributes or five winemaking technologies that, or decisions that I make in putting the Plus wine together. So it's plus this, plus that, plus three other things as well. So that's where the name comes from. Big green canopy, loose cluster, low yield. I pick it earlier than I do the regular game ranch because we've got so much power into the canopy and just makes these really, really intense wines. So this is Goldschmidt Game Ranch Plus Oakville in the heart of Napa Valley. So the funny thing about terraced vineyards, is this amazing or what? This is gonna be the smallest berries you've ever seen on Cabernet. So we've only got a little small lot of this. This is the Yeoman Goldschmidt Cabernet Sauvignon from the Alexander Valley. But the berries are so small, the juice is so minute. Check this out, I'm gonna try and punch this down. It's impossible. <laughs> I don't work out enough. I gotta get one of my young boys over here. Hey Danny, show us how it's done, man. Show us how you punch down a small berry Cabernet from the Alexander Valley. Look at that, you Pinot winemakers. You Pinot winemakers don't understand Cabernet at all. Anyway, Goldschmidt, Yeoman, Alexander Valley, punching down here. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, that really shows, <laughs> in, in fact, that was the um, Yeoman Plus. I, I should have said that in the video, but I had it on top of the screen, but that goes to show just how small those berries are and how little the juice is. And that's why the Plus wine is just so, and, and impressive and I mean it's just rich and just you know it's just pouring licorice and black fruits and just anyway I could drink plus all day it's just such a mouth filling wine but at the same time it has it has enough acidity you know to keep that thing bright and I assure you if I ever have to live in a bunker for 15 years I'm just taking the plus with me so again um, this is the 15 right up uh, of the of the plus wines which are just which were just sent out now and you can see that um, uh, again, the game ranch uh, was scored higher than the than the yeoman. So just a little bit about the plus, uh, we've we've covered a fair bit of it, but um, the key things it's the outside rows, it's lower yield, it's got more powerful canopy in the winemaking. It's uh, the four key elements, which four or five, six, whichever way you want to talk about. It, I'm I'm trying to cut down on my number of elements. We, we were at 200% new barrel, we're back down to, a, I'm backing it off a little bit, even though you can't see it, it's, uh, um, anyway, we could talk about that. The calculated VA, which I'll, I'll just talk about that in a minute, and then the, the two day to the drain. So on the new label, what, what I did was, uh, we teamed up and we decided on the new label that we would put some of these elements. So we talk about topography, 
So the east facing, the Piedmont, which means the middle of the slope, and the outside rows. That to me is the topography piece. The harvest criteria is, of course, it's earlier than normal because I explained is that it has a bigger canopy and less crop, and so it ripens a little earlier, and we have to really be on it. It's a much harder picking decision than the regular game ranch or the regular yeoman because, as I said, the tannins stall. You know, they go green, dusty, dry, 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 raisin because the vine is taking moisture from the soil, and when that moisture goes, the only other moisture you can get is the grape. And so the, 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 in, in a four-day period, that berry can go from a nice round berry until raisin. It's, it, you have to be on it, you've got to be really quick. As far as the technique, it's one year longer in wood. It was 200% new wood, it doesn't show, but we are reducing the amount of wood for different reasons. Um, and it has uh, this early onset of VA, which I'm about to talk about, and then it takes two days to get us out of the skins. And then the fourth thing, it's very limited because we only, well, we actually make five barrels a year, but I get rid of one of the barrels very early on. And so I always, it's usually, We've never made five barrels, it's always three to four. And uh, recently, the last vintage, I think Michael was three barrels, was the was the plus game ranch. I think we, right. we only made three, three barrels. barrels. <laughs> so this early onset of VA is, so I actually hand drew this. <laughs> so we'll see. So if this is volatile acidity, so volatile acidity is a blend of ethyl acetate and acetic acid, which is a bacterial ferment. So we talk about yeast fermenting sugar to alcohol, bacteria fermenting malic acid to lactic acid, Britannomyces, which is a yeast, and then this is the fourth ferment. This is the this is the the one that we get uh, in the winery, and again, it sometimes it has the same food resources as Britannomyces. So sometimes if we get VA we sometimes, it's also an indicator of Britannomyces as well. So we're not talking about Brett here, we're solely talking about bacteria, and we're, talking, we're not talking about Leuconostoc enos, which is the bacteria that ferments malactolactic. Here we're talking about Pedicoccus, Enicoccus, and Lactobacillus, okay? In a spoilage, spoilage situation, you get ethyl acetate is nail polish remover, of course, and then acetic acid is vinegar. But we also harness that sort of thing for sherry, especially with fluorphenos. When we make fluorphenos, we're really looking for aldehydes and we can really develop those aldehydes by using um, lactobacill um, lactobacillus. So if we, this is a traditional aging of a wine, okay? You put it in barrel and it has relatively low volatile acidity. And at the end of three years, I can smell it. I can either smell it as acetic, uh, either elastic, or as I can taste it as acetic acid. The legal limit is 1.2 milligrams per liter. Okay, this is set by the OIV, which is the International Enology Association for the World. So the 1.2 uh, milligrams per liter. Now, most wine that you drink in California is around about 0.8. Uh, once you go above 1.2, you're talking about sherries or ports. So what we do is we encourage this bacteria to occur in the first three months. This is a technique that I learned from a very famous Australia in Australia, a very famous winery in Australia. Some of you have heard me talk about it before. And the key thing is how to control this after three months. How do I control this bacteria? Because sometimes the VA just continues to grow. So we have to figure out a way to control that. And that's sort of, uh, where experience and knowledge come in or, you know, working with other wineries and you know how to figure it out. So at the end of this time, instead of smelling and tasting this acetic acid um, or ethyl acetate, all I get is this, this is, this is what helps us give this big plush, supple, uh, round tannin and big black licorice flavors. And not in a, when I say licorice, I don't mean in a green sense. I just mean in a black sense. So black plums and, and um, blackberry characters. But just, this is why we only make three or four barrels is because it's so damn hard to make this thing and it takes a lot of effort. So the attributes of the plus, it gets a longer time on skin, so it has way more stability and complexity than we, than we could get otherwise. We have a year longer in barrel and one of the reasons I do that is because it helps me, it's under my control for a lot longer period of time and therefore we use less preservative, less filtration, uh, etc. or no filtration, of course. 
The wood doesn't show at all because the fruit is so rich and so powerful. It's a tiny volume. And so if you if you're looking to win friends, I mean this is a this is a great wine to go and win friends with because it's going to be really hard to find. It's very limited and the 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 wines are amazing in themselves. The VA evolution of course is key. It just gives us this massive complexity and then the way that we drain the wine out of the tank. It, it's it, I don't, this is the most, I don't normally share this information, but one thing I will tell you is that by taking a long time to drain, the weight of the grapes actually acts as a natural press. And so instead of getting a pressed wine character, you get this fullness that you get from pressed wine. Um, pressing is a, is a very difficult technique, but we're running out of time, so I don't want to get too much into it. Some of the accolades that you've seen on those wines, and as I said, 96 and 98 for the, for the uh, 2015s, I'm sorry, not the 14s. And you talk, we talk about elegant and powerful vintages and they're not so good vintages and you've seen me draw that before, but basically the vintages in recent memory, I mean, we had a little hiccup and the vintages 11 and 12, but you know, 12 of course is the best vintage in recent memory, but 13 through um, 18, 19 now have just been exceptional vintages and so you can't really go wrong. And uh, it's been a real joy to work in California for those vintages. Cabernet is our focus at Goldschmidt Vineyards. Everything we do is 100% vintage variety and vineyard. And yes, they are all vegan. These are real stories. These are real places. I can take you to the vineyards and you can see them. I've been working on these vineyards since 1990. In the Alexander Valley Yeoman, we're talking about Lancaster, Silver Oak, Robert Young. Uh, as the, I don't know who A is. Uh, as neighbours. And in Oakville, we're talking about Scream Eagle, Tench, Plump Jack, Rudd, which we already discussed. And Catherine itself, when we talk about the two go-to wines of what we just discussed, the Catherine is, is uh, one of the four most popular Alexander Valley Cabernets in California and Texas. So very easy go-to wine. And then for an Icon wine, even though Game Ranch is relatively expensive for us at $85 and Game Ranch, I'm sorry, and the Game Ranch Plus being at about $130, $40, that's relatively cheap compared to who our neighbors are. I mean, really cheap when you compare it to what our neighbors are. So hopefully people remember us during these difficult times and they're looking to, uh, to uh, save a little money and, and, but still drink Oakville, these are the go-to wines. So obviously Hillary at 55-ish is, is, is an incredible value, but so is, so is the Game Ranch. But don't forget the Yeoman, man. These are good wines too. Keep drinking Alexander Valley. Help us little guys out too. So anyway, those are my contacts. Um, I just wanna say thank you for joining me again and uh, we're looking for comments for next week if there's any chats. Um, oh, I forgot this. I have a little poll here. Um, so I'm going to give you guys a little bit of time. Uh, I'm going to give you about uh, 30 seconds here. You can vote. Do you like red fruit or black fruit wines? Do you like Alexander Valley, Oakville or Paso? Or if you scroll down, um, how many wines did I describe that we make from uh, Napa Valley? So go. Seven more seconds. Two, one. Okay, let's end the polling there. So what we got is, man, we're we're tied, man. Red fruit, black fruit, both got fifty percent. So that that's uh, that's really interesting. Um, currently, do you drink more um, wine from Alexander Valley or Oakville? Well, that was interesting, or Paso, and that was interesting. So. 90% of the people that voted preferred, well, drink more Alexander Valley and 10% of the people drink Oakville. Wow, that is a pleasant surprise. I appreciate that. And how many wines do we make from, I didn't give you much time. How many wines do we make from Napa Valley was actually a really trick question because I didn't talk about one of them. <laughs> because we make this one. I said Napa Valley, not Oakville. So we also make Yardstick. So Yardstick is from Napa Valley. So we make... Yardstick, Hillary, Game Ranch, and Game Ranch Plus. So the answer is four. So 30% of the people got four. And 50% of the people said three. And 20% uh, of the people said two. I would have also accepted five because I talked about Ultimatum, which will also come from the Oakville in the end as well. Anyway, so uh, thank you for participating in the 
in the polling as well, and you'll see that when I send the link back after I come off record. So uh, again, thank you very much, Michael. Any any questions? Anything you want to a say? Actually, I have a question for you. Well, it's more of a comment that I want you to flesh out a little bit. So when we're discussing regular uh, Oakville Game Ranch versus the Plus Game Ranch, we know that the Plus comes from the outer rows, and so the outer rows show more vigor. So you have high canopy, lower crop, higher tannin. How would you want us to describe the overall style of Plus, given that they all come from this dense outer uh, three rows uh, compared to the regular uh, game ranch. Mm. Yeah, be careful with with um, one one comment on the tannin. Remember, there's a difference between amount of tannin and ripeness of tannin. So the dense wine or the high vigor wine, this is true for the Catherine when I showed that video of the high vigor. Yes, those vines have more tannin volume, but because of the ripeness of them, they don't taste tannic at all. But stylistically, I think what I did was I tried to show um, the style here of what we're trying to achieve. But really, if we were to like graph, if we were to put this in the, into, you know, because I got to put everything in a box, right? So if we were to put this in a, in a box, and you mentioned tannin, and we talk about amount of tannin, volume of tannin, and the amount of complexity, and that's my elegant, powerful, dense thing, you know. And we want to put all the wines in a box. This is this is no offense to Pinot Noir, but Pinot Noir has less tannin. It does have a lot of complexity, but we can argue that. But based on tannin, the volume of tannin should be less on Pinot. Syrah, Zinfandel, Bordeaux, California Bordeaux. California Bordeaux has always been celebrated by having maximum complexity, maximum extraction of the tannin, and these big blockbuster wines, which can sometimes be very exhausting. What I'm trying to do is move the wines in this direction. And I think if you lined up, uh, if we started even back in, I think the first significant change for me was like 95. So going back from 95 and really coming to where we are today, and remember, it's not about I'm um, decreasing complexity. If, if you go back to this tongue drawing again, what I'm trying to do is, is move the wine more forward in the mouth, really make the wines more fruity. And if we were to draw this three-dimensionally and put in the, um, the pieces that we mentioned, remember we talked about black fruit and red fruit, what I'm trying to do is move away from the, um, you know, black black cherry is kind of the darkest that I want to be, the black cherry character. And I really want to be in this red cherry, uh, black plum, black plum character. I want to be in this realm here. And that's why I'm trying to make the wines move more forward. So I want to have these wines be equally complex, but I want to have the tannins be really supple and really round. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, folks? You're welcome. Low cost neighborhood, that's me. I'm the cheap rent guy. <laughs> anyway, thank you for joining me. Uh, next week, um, I'm just gonna come off record and I'll send you guys the link. I did not do that last week, so I'll send you two links this week for those who are here. But next week, um, I'm looking for votes uh, to, um, uh to what i will discuss i was thinking about having my son come on and we could talk about argentina and chile or i could go back on and we could talk again about um some of the the things that are happening at this time of the year in the vineyard and i see there's a couple more questions but i'm going to hit come off record